nine o'clock. Right yeah, great. Well, welcome everybody. Before we um, start um, H610, I'd just like to go around the room and say hello to everybody and have folks introduce themselves. I'm Michael Reinhardt. I'm with Staffing Rent Group Consulting. David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Chris Stephanie Mailer with Representative NQ. Uh, Catherine Gregory also with Representative Q. Ella Gunnam also with Representative Q. Wayne Fisher, Orca, Media. Brian Pearson, Chief Superior Judge. Carolyn Hansen, Attorney General's Office. Jessica Marquis, Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Sarah Robinson, also from the Vermont Network. Natalie Silver with the Nick Classic Group. Ed Cutler, President, Gun Owners of Vermont. Eric Davis, Vice President, Gun Owners of Vermont. Chris Bradley, President, Vermont Federation of Sportsman's Clubs. Tim Meehan, Federation. Laura Subin, Gun Sense Vermont. Gabrielle Molina, Gabby Gifford, Scourge, Defense and Violence. James Pepper, Department of State Attorney and Sheriffs. Eric Patrick, your lawyer attorney. Uh, Ali House, also with Representative Pew. Bethany House, also with Representative Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Madam Chair is well represented here today. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yes, she is. Great. Okay, welcome. Um, Eric, thank you. And I assume folks either um, have copies of the bill or have access to it online. Right? Everybody have, have what they need in terms of the bill? Okay, great. Welcome. Um, yeah. Is he going to? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Your first visit of the year. I know, my first walk through of the year. <laughs> I'm trying to settle into my familiar spot. For trying to get the seats. I know. To me. New chairs. Yes, I know. It's good. But nice to see everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I am here. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Here to talk about H610, which is an act related to firearms and domestic violence two topics which the committee is very familiar with, having spent a lot of time over the last few years dealing with both firearms and domestic violence. You'll see as we walk through the bill that there are a number of different discrete topics related to firearms and or domestic violence within the bill. Uh, I'm sure the committee remembers them well, but at the same time I thought that as we go through each subject it might be helpful to have a minute or two of background to sort of lay the foundation, refresh everybody's recollection. Um, uh, as we go through that, feel free to jump in and ask questions. Maybe there's something I, I didn't cover as thoroughly as I, as I could. Uh, but hopefully the idea of that is to uh, get everyone sort of with a little space layer of knowledge so then we can <coughs> propose changes within that section of the bill. Great. That sort of makes sense as a way to... Perfect. Good. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, sure. And I see there's a lot of witnesses on the on the agenda this morning, too. So I'll try and jump right in, but feel free to speed me up. Yeah, well. now take your time, and, and this is not the only day we're, we're doing this. So if we don't get to folks, we'll certainly will make sure we get to the next time. Okay. That sounds good. So with that uh, in mind, then, let's start right in with Section 1 of the bill. This uh, piece of the of H610 deals with background checks. So firearm sales background checks. Now, this is a topic that has come up in the committee quite a bit over the last couple of years, as I mentioned. Uh, to give a little background of what, what, what sort of exists in the law at the moment, it's helpful to know that there's two different laws relating to the background checks for firearm sales. There's a federal law and there's a state law. Now, the federal law uh, applies to sales of firearms um, from federal licensees. They're known as uh, FFLs, Federal Firearms Licensees. Essentially, that means a dealer in firearms. So uh, generally, that's a person who's involved in the business of selling firearms, so that, you know, a store that sells firearms, a business, that sort of thing. Uh, the Federal Firearms Background Check applies to sales by licensees, by stores. Uh, now, uh, you may recall that in 2018, the legislature passed a state law relating to background checks, and that would apply to sales between private persons. 
So it's not doesn't have to be a licensee who's making the sale. It would be a private person who's making the sale. And in that situation, uh, a background check would be required also. So that's the big picture. The, um, the state firearms law is, uh, sorry, the state firearms background check law is what you see in front of you in section one of the bill. That is 13 BSA 4019. And the, um, the language of the federal law is very actually necessary to sort of understand a little bit before we look at the changes being made in section one. So I'm going to try and pull that up right now. Is there something I should hit myself and get visible back here? Or? Sort of remote control there. Pardon me? Remote control. Um, you want the red, red yeah. button? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I mentioned, the federal law on background checks applies to sales made by, uh, by folks that are in the business of selling firearms, federal <coughs> firearms licensees. Oh, here we go. We're fading in here. Um, and Section 1 deals with a particular piece of uh, that federal statute, which we are about to look at. Subsection T here. I'm going to take a lot of scrolling down. So we'll get there. As you can see, this is a lengthy statute. <laughs> so here we are. Um, the this is the federal. 920, 18 U.S.C. 922T, which is the federal uh, firearms transfer background check provision. And the, the language that we really want to focus on, is, it starts in subdivision one, but skip the first few lines there since the, the act is in effect already. But you'll see that uh, a license, it's sort of in the highlighted blue language is where it starts, the second piece of that. Licensed importer, manufacturer, or licensed dealer, that's who we're talking about because these sales are mostly made by licensed dealers shall not transfer a firearm to any other person who's not licensed under this chapter unless, and this is the, what you've heard we've talked about before, the NIC system, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. So before this transfer can be made by a licensed firearms dealer, they, you see under subdivision A, they have to contact NICs, and the dealers have a system in which they can contact NICs instantaneously. You'll know that the, the title of this uh, or the name of the, or of the entity is the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. That's what it's meant to be quickly. They can make a quick contact. So that's what they do. They have to contact the system. And then under Subdivision B, you see, then what happens after they contact them? Well, the system provides the licensee, that's the dealer who's making the uh, communication, with a unique identification number. So they get a, what, what happens in order for them to get that number back is that they get a word from the NIC system that the person is clear. In other words, they're not in the, in the list of prohibited categories. You sort of remember that uh, topic that we dealt with in this committee quite a bit as well. You could be convicted of a certain violent crime. You could have been uh, subject to a, a hospitalization order for mental health reasons by a court. You could be a fugitive from justice. You could be subject to a relief from abuse order. There's a long <coughs> list of categories of people who are prohibited from possessing firearms by federal law, uh, by state law now as well. But um, that information is maintained by the NIC system so that when the dealer contacts them, the idea is they come up with either a hit or a miss on this person who's proposing to buy the firearm. Either that person is listed in one of these categories or they're not. And if they're not, uh, then that's when uh, they provide the dealer with this unique identification number. And that number is associated <laughs> with the transfer and they save that number, you see down in subdivision C there, or no, sorry, uh, two, the firearm is not violated, that just means if the person doesn't come up on one of these prohibited categories, then they assign this unique number to the transfer, um, and that's what gets saved. All other records are destroyed, the transfer is just sort of recorded by number only, and that's how they can, in the future, always know, you, know, you can, you know, you've sort of heard how you can backtrack and find out where, where a gun was sold, how, how it made its way from one person to another, they do it through the association of this unique identification number. So, that's subdivision one there, B1. You see, that's what happens uh, in one uh, one possible fact pattern. 
But look at subdivision two, different possibility. What if there is no unique identification number yet, but three business days pass, three business days go by since the licensee contacted the system. So in other words, they contacted Nix, asked for uh, a background check on this person who's proposing to make the purchase, and the system has not notified the licensee that the receipt of a firearm by that person would violate GRN. In other words, they have not told them within those three days that the person's name has come up on one of the prohibited categories list, right? They haven't been flagged. But they haven't answered either. For whatever reason, it's taken longer than it ordinarily takes. And I don't have the facts. My witnesses may be able to tell you what the statistics are on this, but the vast majority of cases, uh, purchases, I should say, um, they get it. Uh, uh, an answer instantly, but it's a small minority of cases in which they don't. And if three days pass, you see the way the statute is written, if three days pass, they don't get an answer, then the transfer can proceed. Everybody understand that? So it's not that it's required to proceed, but it can. The, the seller can proceed with a transfer if they haven't got an answer from the NIC system within three days. That, in, uh, sort of from a legal perspective, is known as the default proceed. Sort of anecdotally, you, you may have heard it referred to as the Charleston loophole, uh, but I refer to it from the, from the legal description, which is the default proceed. In other words, there's a default um, in that there was no answer given, but they proceed with the transaction if three days have passed and they haven't got an answer. So that's <coughs> the background. Um, any, sorry. Any idea how often that happens? I mean, I've never read anything or even thought to look it up as far as um, how many. Uh, Guns can be sold after that three-day loophole. I'm going to guess there's probably percentage-wise, there's probably not that many, but I'm sure it happens. I don't have the exact numbers. No, some of your witnesses might, but yeah, right. I think you're right. From what I've read, uh, anecdotally, yes, the majority of sales happen within the prior to that three-day window when, he, when they get an instant response. Right. So, um, but I don't have a percentage specific. Specific. Oh, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Question yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. So, what would cause that? In in other words, sort of, if it, if you're, what, what is it? What does the situation look like where the three days would expire, and a person would be able to do the what, default release or default proceed proceed? Yep. Uh, that that they would be able to move forward with that um, when typically you would expect that they would. I don't know if that makes sense. You mean like why might that happen? So yeah. Essentially, why why might that happen? And then you know, do, is the firearms dealer alerted on the fourth day, and that's how you find out that it wouldn't have normally proceeded? Or uh, I think in terms of of why that happens, a couple of situations that I've I've read about in which it might happen is just that, for example, a criminal conviction um, pops up on the record check with the NIC system, but it's not clear right away whether that particular type of conviction would prohibit the person, whether it fits into one of the categories. And so further research might be needed to try and figure out, well, this person was convicted of this offense under state law at one point in time, but is that really, for example, a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence? That happens to be one of, of, one of the list of prohibited categories. Does that fit under that definition? More time may be required for the NICS uh, staff to research that and figure it out, and that may be, that's just one possibility that I happen to have recently read about that sometimes <coughs> when the categorization isn't clear, that's why the three-day period will continue, or, or why it will take longer than three days to get an answer. And does the firearms dealer get the result even if it's after that? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. You mean like if time passes and they haven't Let's got a Let's say they yet? decide that, yep. you know, would, would, the, would the system be providing that information, say, five days after? Right. Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I'm not sure the answer to that. Yeah. So, Eric, do you know if, um, I'm just thinking of all the fake IDs that younger people use um, or can buy online to get into bars, et cetera. Right. Is part of the checking, checking the ID to see if it's a real person? Like how, because it sounds like they're just looking at a list, but if I bought a driver's license, and just, I'm not who I say I am, mm -hmm. how would they know that? They do do an ID check. Yep, that's, I'm just trying to find that. It's uh, in addition to, uh, 
but within the uh, dairy farm. See, in subdivision C there. See, that's another thing that has to happen within that sale. The transfer has to verify the identity by examining identification documents. So, you know, yes, you're right. It's I mean, there were some very sophisticated right. ones that right. I have seen people purchase that mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe that they're fake. Not real. But right. maybe. I think it sort of depends upon the, um, <coughs> the uh, uh, ability of the licensee to <coughs> make that decision, though. You're right. right. You know, there may be times when uh, uh, false license is so good that it may pass. So it's not like a birth certificate. It's not like when you go to get a passport where you have to give three, you know, piece of mail, a, a birth certificate. It's just a simple ID. Well, um, I'll follow picture. up on you with that okay. because I see that the, the valid identification document term is defined. I didn't follow up on that okay. preliminarily, but that's worth looking to see, like what what they accept. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Everyone sort of have a handle on how that how that uh, system works. So the next thing we're going to look at then is well, what does the proposal of an H six ten do do to this default proceed uh, provision in federal law? So um, let's look at that language. It's on page four. Thank you. Um, now again, sorry. Yeah, yeah, just to be clear, everything yep. we've gone over so far, like on page, that's not necessarily page one, but on two and three with everything that's listed, that's all existing law. Yes, that's what you passed in 2018. Exactly, that's the state background check provision. And you're again, just a quick uh, refreshment of your recollection. You remember what that did was the state uh, background check provision applied to sales between private people, right? The federal one only applies to federal licensees. The state one applies to private sales with some exceptions like immediate family, law enforcement, those kind of things are accepted. You don't have to do background checks in those situations. But it did sort of piggyback onto the federal system in the sense that the way it worked procedurally was the proposed person who's selling and the proposed person who's buying have to go to uh, the, the licensee together and the licensee has to facilitate the transfer. In other words, they do the background check on the person who's going to buy the firearm just the same way they would do it as if they were selling it themselves. And if they come up with a hit and the person is flagged by NICS to be in one of the prohibited categories, then they have to hit give the firearm back and uh, decline to facilitate the transfers. But you sort of remember that whole process. So that's the way it's set up in state law, um, but it, as I said, it sort of um, piggybacks on the, on the federal system. So. Uh, the same default proceed provision that would apply um, in the federal context applies in the, to the state. <coughs> so, subdivision D um, addresses that default proceed situation. It's in, in, what it says is that the firearm cannot be transferred if, and you see subdivision one, a background check is required under this section or federal law. So that means, you know, it's a transfer by a licensee, which would be a federal background check situation, or it's a transfer by a private person. But again, it only says if the background check is required. So again, those ones between family members, law enforcement, anything that's accepted, that's exempted, I should say, um, under the state law, this doesn't apply to that either. But if it does, if there's a background check required, then um, the transfer can't happen until you look at the language in line seven through nine now. It, um, cannot happen in, uh, uh, if the licensed dealer has not been provided with a unique identification unique identification number by NICS. So that brings us back to that first section. Everybody see how that works then? What that means is that the default proceed option would no longer exist. They have to get, they have to go take a quick look at the, the language again. You see, under the federal law, the transfer can happen either if you get a unique identification number, that means that uh, the person essentially came up clear, right? They're not prohibited. Or three business days pass. Well, now what you're saying in state law is no transfer can happen. Uh, unless you get the unique identification. It has to go the route where Nix affirmatively determines that the person is not in one of the prohibited categories and the transfer can be forward. So the default proceed option um, is eliminated for purposes uh, of your state statutes. And so there's the background a background check in, in a sense would therefore be complete is, is another way to look at it. Uh, yeah, at least the, the, they would have determined that a person is not in any one of the uh, uh, categories that prohibits them from possessing a firearm. 
And also, it's uh, uh, my great pleasure to note my first, first typo of the session since my first time in it. You see line 13, <laughs> it says, so this is, so what you've done is, okay, so that's the prohibition. You rope this into the existing criminal penalty as well, which is a one-year misdemeanor on lines 13 through 15. However, uh, when it says subsection C, it should say subsection D, because you see that the new provision there is lines 4 through 9. What you're doing is um, making that new statute uh, subject to the same criminal sanction that you have in the existing law for a background check violation, which is one year and um, $500 fine. First typo, but I'm sure not the last. Probably not even in this bill, actually. But, uh, <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> um, so uh, that is all I have to say about the background check piece. Um, you may have just said it as I was reading. I might not have heard it, but on, on line 13, at section 2, the person who violates a uh, possible year imprisonment, 500, that's a misdemeanor, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any, any, I know there's different classification for misdemeanors. Right. Any certain class, what, what would be the classification, I guess, on this, or just, just misdemeanor? Oh, right now, we don't have a classification system for misdemeanors. Oh, okay. So you, you may be thinking about there's legislation that's been proposed that we talked about doing that. Oh, that's I, you may study committee, and I think we're, maybe uh, this committee will be talking about adopting that sort of system. Right now, it's just right, either okay. misdemeanor or felony. Okay. Yeah. Um, move on to relief from use order. Quick, very quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we have? I, so it, I know it says here on page five that one of the exemptions is transfer from one immediate family member to another immediate family member. Did we have the definition of what an immediate family member is somewhere in here, or is it just not yes, included? Yes, I believe that is in there. Yes. Okay. So um, I can follow up with you on that, or we'll okay. next time we can chat about it. But yes, that is in the statute for sure. Thanks. Yeah. So, moving on to the relief from abuse order sections, which are section two and three to start with. I'm gonna go back and look at, again, helpful for a moment to look at uh, what the current relief from abuse order statute says, and that is 15 BSA 1103, which I'm hopeful is gonna pop up right here. So, under the existing law, you can see 1103A, any family or household member uh, can seek relief from abuse by going to court and they file a complaint, they file a petition, and they're asking the court to find essentially that they've been abused and that there's a danger of abuse in the future. I mean, there's some more permutations to that, but the big picture is they've been abused by the defendant and there's a danger of abuse in the future. If that's the case, if the court finds that, the court can issue an, what's known as an RFA, Relief from Abuse Order, uh, that's going to prohibit uh, the defendant from, and there's a long list in, of, of potential uh, limitations that the that the court can issue that the defendant can't contact the plaintiff. You see uh, the list right here, and this is not an exclusive list, by the way. It's just Excuse a list me, list. Eric. This is civil, and when you say the court. Yes. The court, yeah. Yep. Exactly. It's not the criminal division. Thank right. you. Right. It's the uh, family division ordinarily. Um, so you see there in that list starts with A on. Am I, yeah. Okay. So if you look through there, it says various things that the court can order in the relief from abuse order that they uh, vacate the household, award parental rights and responsibilities, parent-child contact, contact between the plaintiff and the defendant. There's a, there's a long list of things that the court can um, order to happen when it finds that there's been abuse and there's a danger of abuse in the future. Now you see an important point here under subsection B there, and this will uh, be important as we go forward, that generally speaking, the court grants relief only after notice to the defendant and hearing. You see that in subsection B? Um, now that's that's important to say generally speaking because that's this is a final relief from abuse order. However, there's also an emergency relief from abuse order, and, that, and in that case, if the court finds that there's an immediate danger, an immediate danger of further abuse, then it can be issued ex parte, which I think everyone can remember that the ex parte means the notice has not been provided to the defendant yet. The person goes into the court on their own, and they get an order from the court without yet providing notice. Um, to the defense, so the defense might not have been there. And that's what ex parte means, huh? by, their own, <coughs> by their, own, their own individual. Now, if that happens, uh, they have to go back into court to, uh, the emergency order only lasts for 14 days. So in other words, 
the idea is that you don't want to have uh, too much time expire without the person having had a chance to respond. So after that 14-day period, ordinarily, um, if the circumstances uh, warrant it, they'll go back in and try and get this final order, that, um, in which case the defendant gets notice and they have an opportunity to come in and, and uh, respond to it. So the emergency one can be done ex parte on their own. Final one defendant has to be there, but the emergency typically only lasts for 14 days, and that's what's in the statute. So, um, <coughs> cling back and forth here, but uh, all right. So that's kind of your big picture background on what RFAs uh, do now. And as as I was just saying, right, there's a there's a sort of a long list in the statute of different things that might be in the order when the court issues it. What uh, the first piece of H610 does is it adds some things that have to be in that order. It's not a may, it's a shall. It says, here are some things that have to be in the order and they're related to firearms. What are they? And they really deal with relinquishment, um, where the defendant can reside, and notice being provided to the defendant are the three big picture things. So you see, the first one is the order has to require immediate relinquishment. That's line 13. Until the expiration of the order, so again, it's not permanent, but as long as the order is in effect, of all firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control, or that another person possesses, owns, or controls on behalf of the defendant. So, relinquishment is the key piece of the, to sort of take away from that paragraph. Order has to have it. <laughs> Number two, order has to pro prohibit the defendant from residing at a residence where firearms are present. So, firearms can't be in a residence where uh, the defendant is residing. <coughs> And number three, has to inform the defendant that he or she is prohibited from possessing firearms until the expiration of the order. So there has to be language right in the order that says you are prohibited uh, by a state and or federal law from prohibiting, a, uh, sorry, from possessing a firearm while this order is in effect. So three requirements that are added to what has to have to be in the order when the court issues it. Say in the situation, uh, married couple, Big gun collection, relief from abuse, has to move out of the house, the guns are still in the house. Are those confiscated at that point? It, it, I mean, the, the, the person who actually owns the guns and has the RFA isn't even there. Um, I think that's a good question, and, and the, the, you know, it might be something for Judge Grierson or some, one of the other witnesses to talk about whether there's some discretion on the part of the court there. If the order prohibits the person from residing at the house, might there be some discretion for the court to not confiscate the firearms? That's an interesting point. Um. I, I have a question in total ignorance being new to the Judiciary <laughs> no, no. Committee. Um, is it typical to have that much of a directive to, um, to the court to say that an order shall include this in, to take away that discretion uh, from a, from a, from what is essentially a, a court decision, it's not at all uncommon, mm -hmm. but it's also it's you know it's a sort of 50-50 situation. There are times when the committee decides court should have discretion, but it's it's also very common for there are certain areas where the the legislature will decide we really want the court to do A, B, or C. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Coach Heather? Yes. Um, so another scenario. So the uh, immediate family member um, uh, has received the firearms and the order is imposed. How does that family member find out that he or she has to relinquish uh, the person's firearms, especially if they're not communicating well uh, personally? Right. You know, like what kind of a, does an order get sent to them as well, or I mean, what's the tracking on that, or would you think? I would think that if the immediate family member is in possession of firearms, and this sort of brings up the same question that Representative Burdett was getting at, which is that that itself could qualify as relinquishment, so that the, the person no longer is in possession of it. I forgot to mention, though, that there's also another exception that, this, that the statute proposes here. You'll see that on line 12 there it says, this relinquishment is required unless subdivision four applies. 
So subdivision four, let's look at what that is. That is essentially permits, um, see that's line 17 through 21, essentially permits the defendant to go uh, before the judge and uh, under oath state that they don't possess any firearms. So they have an option to say, well, uh, um, uh, I don't have any, I'm not possessing any. And in that case, uh, the order doesn't have to include relinquishment. Everybody see that? If, as long as they testify under oath. Now, it's also an important, interesting point about that, or an important point is this only applies in the final order, right? We're looking at the final order language right now. That option of um, the defendant going in and testifying that they don't have firearms <laughs> doesn't exist in the emergency order, and that makes sense because remember, that's ex parte. It might not be there anyway. Uh, so, um, but. Uh, it is. It does exist in the final order, so if later on when they get noticed, they come to the hearing, they can come and testify under oath that they don't possess any firearms, then the relinquishment order doesn't have to be issued. All right, so that's the first piece of the RFA stuff. We're going to move on to another uh, topic within the RFA provision, and this is another addition that you see in H610, and this is subdivision B. We're going on to page 7. Now this, in addition to what we just talked about, what has to be in the order, this provides the court with the authority to issue a warrant simultaneously with the order. So at the same time that it issues the RFA, it can simultaneously issue a warrant uh, for the seizure of firearms that are in the defendant's possession, in, in the defendant's possession, provided that it makes these three probable cause findings. You see those right there are lines four through seven. It has to find probable cause to believe that, one, there are firearms in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control when the order is issued or while it's in effect. Two, the defendant has committed an act of abuse. And three, a search and seizure, a search for and seizure of the firearms is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of a victim on whose behalf the release is sought. Now, a few seconds of background on that language. You may remember that, uh, generally speaking, a warrant is issued by the court based on probable cause that a crime has been committed or will be committed or is being committed. That's generally speaking true. Probable cause is required for a warrant. This is an unusual situation if you think about it because as you mentioned, Representative Grad, this is a civil context, it's a civil order. Um, the court is issuing uh, this order that, for example, the defendant not have contact with the plaintiff, this RFA, this relief from abuse order, but no crime has been committed yet. And there isn't necessarily any suspicion that any crime is going to be committed. So, uh, in order to address uh, concerns about uh, constitutionality, search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment, under Article 11 of the Vermont Constitution. That's why this language is in there, to require that the court make a probable cause finding. And uh, it's helpful to know, this is, it's on your, I'm not gonna jump to the link right now, but on your, on the uh, page of links that I sent you, you'll see a decision of the New Jersey Supreme Court. And there's only a couple of states that actually have this process in place at the moment, this process where simultaneously with the issuance of the RFA, a warrant is issued as well. New Jersey, and I think Delaware is the other one. Um, New Jersey, as it happened just a few months ago, the Supreme Court of New Jersey issued a, a ruling that constitutionality of that was challenged. And the court held that it was okay for the warrant to issue in the civil relief from abuse context, as long as the court made a probable cause finding that the language of which is tracked right here. So again, I think you could expect that to be litigated in Vermont as well. It's, it's <coughs> very surprising if it were not at some point, but at least you have the advantage of having um, based this language on uh, a ruling of one state Supreme Court that found that it was constitutional. Um, again, no guarantee that that's what the Vermont Supreme Court would say, but um, helpful in the sense that it's, uh, the intent is to track uh, the language of the decision that already upheld that process in another state. Right. So I have a clarifying question. Somebody can't go in and get this order if everything is like perfectly fine and dandy in the relationship, right? They're, they're asking for relief from abuse. Right. So there's sort of the, there's enough evidence, I guess, that the judge is saying there's abuse going on, I'm gonna order a relief from abuse order. Yes. So sort of a crime, like we're assuming something illegal right happened in order well the definition of abuse isn't always necessarily a crime but, might be, it might not. but it's not like hey Fred didn't make dinner tonight and prop you know what I mean like it's yeah, not yeah. something casual <laughs> exactly. right so so there's 
So I, I'm just questioning when you say no crime has been committed, mm -hmm. it just seems more casual than I think. No crime in those. In, codes, in the. But in the criminal, this is civil, but there right. still is a, a, an, an, an action, a wrong that. That has to rise to a level that a judge is going to take it seriously. Right. And I think that's exactly why it was one of the sort of bases that the court in New Jersey said when they said that when they upheld the issuance of the warrant in those situations is that, as you say, it's not just some pedestrian situation. Right. It's, it's a situation in which there's danger, potential danger to the, to the plaintiff right. involved. And um, so it, while it may not technically be a crime, it's still uh, certainly a wrongful act. Otherwise, the order wouldn't have issued. Right. Um, C and D, actually, I'm going to pass over a little bit. That's just boilerplate language that we've seen in here quite a bit. It's really just is the procedure of what happens to the firearm that actually is seized. And that's, we've had, the statute's been on the books for several years, and um, you probably have heard the ongoing discussion about how much room do we have for these firearms, but that's sort of an issue for another day. This follows the same process they already have in law, where they're, uh, who handles them. It gives law enforcement immunity in line 11 through 16. In other words, they can't be sued if, for damage that happens unless they've been grossly negligent or reckless. reckless. But that's, uh, as I say, boilerplate that's um, in a number of other places in firearms related statutes as well. Um, subdivision 4, we already talked about. This was the exception. You remember that uh, they don't have to issue, they don't have to order relinquishment in the order if the person testifies under oath that, uh, that they don't possess any firearms. And lastly, uh, with respect to the RFA piece, um, you'll see that the, uh, there's some specific requirements for the forms. The complaint and the affidavit have to include specific provisions gathering information about the defendant's firearms, specifically, and questions that require the plaintiff, that's the person who files for the order, they have to state with particularity the type and location of any firearm in the defendant's possession. So anything that they know about, about the defendant's firearms, has to be presented in the complaint and in the affidavit. So that's, I think, more of an information gathering piece but to allow the court to, to know whether or not um, it needs to issue an order for relinquishment. At least this way, it requires the plaintiff to state, well, yes, I know that the person has some. So this language, as far as what information is collected, the way I look at it, it's pretty vague. Would that be uh, the type of information that's collected? Would that be uh, defined? under uh, rules of some kind? Because what I'm thinking of, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the type of gun it is, uh, you know, how old it is, serial numbers, and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and myself, I mean, if, you know, if this passes um, and it's implemented, um, now, <laughs> one thing, I don't like lists so much. Now we have a list <laughs> it, with a lot of information on somebody who potentially didn't do anything. You know, maybe the relief from abuse, it, you know, isn't granted or it's, you know, taken away because it's, it's deemed that, you know, it just doesn't meet the qualifications. And now the state has a list of, of uh, you know, this guy's, uh, I don't like to say guy, but uh, this person's uh, uh, possessions and whatever and I, I don't see anything there that once this list is uh, is made that um, is it destroyed afterwards you know um. yeah you're right it, it, the language does not cover that so um, uh, but it certainly could right. so if you felt like that there needed to be some parameters around uh, you know how long that information can be retained what has to be done with it how, when how it can be used that's absolutely something that, that uh, could be could be specified. So uh, the next section is emergency relief from abuse orders. No need to go through this because it's exactly the same as what we just, all it does is set up the exact same process that we just talked about for your standard RFA. The same, the same requirements that have to be in the order that we talked about, relinquishment, residence, and uh, provide the defendant with notice, etc. The warrant language, exactly the same. The storage language is the same. As I mentioned, it doesn't include the stuff about um, a sort of exception that allows the defendant to testify under oath because the defendant might not necessarily be at this hearing. Um, 
So the last piece related to RFAs then is section four, which is a prohibition on people who are subject to RFA orders from possessing firearms. Okay? Now remember, this takes us back, I mentioned this at the beginning. Remember, there already is in statute lists of categories of people who are prohibited from possessing firearms. People who have been convicted of certain crimes. Um, in 2015, I believe it was when we passed the, um, the Vermont statute on prohibiting certain groups of folks from possessing firearms. The way it's, it's um, phrased now is generally speaking, it's a list of crime. Remember, those are serious, serious felonies for the most part, some misdemeanors as well, but mostly felonies. And that generally is how you, how you have defined which people convicted of Vermont crimes um, can possess firearms. But there's been a federal law on the books on this for quite a long time, and it will help for a moment to take a quick look at that because uh, that is related to what you're looking at in front of you right now. Because, as you see, we just noted the language says that, um, that people who are subject to relief from abuse orders cannot possess firearms, right? That's what the language says. And, and the language specifically says both emergency orders, you see that line 18, to jump to an emergency order or a final order, you can't possess a firearm. So that's what the, the proposed language says. If you look under the federal law, which I believe, let me double check on that. Uh, let's go back to G. Federal law also lists, I think there's eight or nine prohibited categories uh, of folks who can't possess Firearms, as I said, it's been on the books for quite some time. Um, here's our list right here. Now, if you look at number eight, <coughs> this is existing federal law. These are folks who are prohibited from firearms possession. A person who is subject to a court order that A, was issued after a hearing, of which the person received actual notice and had an opportunity to participate, and B, restrained the person from harassing, stalking, or threatening an intimate partner of such person or a child of such person, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, sounds like an RFA, right? Which is what it is. It does cover Vermont RFA. So people who are subject to Vermont RFAs in certain circumstances are already prohibited under federal law from possessing firearms. Everybody see that? Anybody? Quick quick quiz? What, what, what's the distinction? Can you just scroll it up just a hair higher? Hair? This way? No, the other way. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's yep. Good. Okay. Just wanted to get You guys are pretty tall back there. Exactly. Well, yep, that's exactly it. So the the uh, you see that the federal law, because it specifically says that only if they're subject to the court order, this is under A, was issued after a hearing at which the person received notice. Remember, emergency orders ex parte, as we said. So no notice, person isn't necessarily going to be there. So that person would not be prohibited by federal law from possessing a firearm. However, if H610 goes forward, then that person is possessed, prohibited from possession by this one. I should note that uh, it's not unusual. In, others, in fact, I think all 50 states now have their own prohibitions on people who can possess firearms. And it's not unusual for, for other state laws to cover um, emergency orders as well, or there were ex parte as a person who was given notice. So, so Eric, um, yeah. This says to own. It Pardon doesn't. Me? So this language says to possess or own, right? Not, but it doesn't say to purchase. And I'm wondering, even if it meant to purchase, how quickly do these orders get put on the federal list? Like daily, or? That was an interesting question for, I think both Judge Pearson and uh, at least as far as the crowd, I think they, the court has a, has a protocol for shipping that information to next. So in terms of purchasing, what if I purchased a gun or a gun that isn't coming for 16 days? So theoretically it will be after my first relief from abuse order, which it doesn't count anyway. So what if I'm purchasing a gun with a delayed delivery time? Like does it stop somebody from purchasing? If they're not taking possession right away, um, I am not sure of the answer to that off the top of my head. In interesting question. Uh, the possession, you certainly can't, you cannot possess it. So if you were to purchase it right away, you'd be in violation for sure. Some delayed delivery system. It's an interesting one. I have to give that a little bit more thought. Okay. Yeah. 
Everybody okay though with this section? Against another, it's a two, two year misdemeanor is the proposal there. Um, so section five uh, is just data collection. I'm, I won't spend too much time on this. This is just a, a data collection provision. So each year, law enforcement agencies that have served relief from abuse orders, either temporary or final, have to collect that data on that and report to the Department of Public Safety. Number of orders issued, number served, uh, and the number of firearms collected pursuant to these orders. Uh, you see also that uh, once DPS gets the data, they have to report it to you folks, the House and Senate Committees on Judiciary. There's also a data collection provision uh, on the number of show co cause hearings that are held in the previous year that the uh, court is supposed to report that to the Judiciary Committees as well. Uh, and now I'm going to move on, if we're okay, to the next topic, which is turbos, which, um, the extreme risk protection order provision. Everybody good with everything? Another thing that was passed in 2018, <laughs> another uh, major piece of legislation that went through this committee. Uh, take a moment to pull up the ERPO language, although we can see something right there. Remember, the, again, the big picture of an ERPO was that it allows uh, a law enforcement person, actually the, a state's attorney or the attorney general, uh, can go into court and get an order from the court. It's actually sort of, and in fact, the language was based on the, uh, the relief from abuse order language. But it's the same idea in the sense that it allows, uh, in this case, uh, a state's attorney or the AG to go into court and get an order from the court that finds that a person is posing an extreme risk of danger as the result of their possession of a dangerous weapon, which is defined to be a firearm or an explosive only. So either one of those two things, if the person poses an extreme risk of danger to themselves or others, uh, the uh, state's attorney or the AG can go in and get an order that prohibits that person from possessing firearms. Again, just like the RFAs, there's an emergency order option and a final order option. The emergency order, I think, also lasts for 14 days. Final order in the ERPO context, I think, is six months. So, if you get, but it can be reduced. So, um, that's what you have on the books currently, and has been on the books for uh, a couple of years now. But as I mentioned, the only uh, people who can file these petition for these orders are state's attorneys or the AG. What you see, the first proposal right here uh, on line 14, <coughs> is, that is proposing to add household members, uh, actually it would be family or household members, you see lines 19 and 20, would also be able to file for these ERPO petitions. Remember that, and it tracks the language that we just looked at. And we just looked at how in the RFA context, family and household members uh, can already file. So what this does is it sort of uh, parallels the two procedures in the same way that the uh, that the RFAs already permit those folks to file. Does that make sense? It's kind of the first the first change that's proposed to be made. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, can you just run through pretty much that whole thing again? Yeah. Definitely. Just because it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> We're right over my head a lot right, of it. Right. So. Um, so right now, to file for one of these emergency risk protection orders, or sorry, extreme risk protection orders, uh, the only person who can, the only party who can file is the state's attorney or the attorney general. They have to be the one who goes into court and files for the order. Um, what this proposes to do is to take the same approach that you have in the relief from abuse order. Remember, we were just looking at that. The people who can file for RFAs are family or household members. So this proposes to add that group to this type of order as well. So family or household members could file for uh, an extreme risk protection order the same way they can file for a relief from abuse order. Right, thank you. Um, and Eric, do you know how many, um, are there other states that, I assume there are other states that have household members? I did look into that, yeah. Okay. Uh, what I turned up was, right now, uh, there's 18 states that have ERPO laws, 17 states in D.C. Uh, of those 18, 13, 12 states in D.C. allow family or household members to vote. And when we passed this, what about six or at the time when we passed this? I don't recall. I was, I was, uh, that's a good question. I was, yeah, I was gonna Four roughly to seven or eight, maybe something like that, maybe right. five or six. I'm not sure, but I can sort of backtrack and see like how many had because it's true that within the last couple of years, a lot of these have been passed right. in states around the country. That's It'd be true. interesting to see when we passed it, how many had household members, right. 
to see you know, what was the landscape then and what's the landscape now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Huh. Uh, last, well, last with respect to her post, you'll see, so the other, that, that's the, the next sections of the bill, I'll just, you'll see, just add family and household member at all the appropriate places in the um, ERPO chapter. So it's the same topic that we just discussed. But the other ERPO piece that you have in here um, is uh, down on page 14. And what this does, uh, and I should point out that uh, this language was already passed by the House and the Senate uh, in the bill that was uh, vetoed by the government last year. So this piece was in the, the same waiting period bill. This was another element of that. And what it did, you may recall that there was testimony last year from a couple of emergency room physicians who were concerned that they were unable to uh, transmit information about patients whom they knew were a danger without violating HIPAA, the health insurance the, basically the Federal Privacy Law Act regard, around people's medical information. So, in order to address that, what this uh, language you see before you does, it essentially permits those communications to be made by healthcare providers without violating HIPAA. And what it does, HIPAA has an existing exception uh, for, you see lines 20 and 21 in federal law, there's an, an exception in HIPAA. Uh, when disclosure of information is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or the public. So arguably, they already would have been able to, to transmit the information even under that existing uh, exception, but I think they were just felt more comfortable um, having it spelled out explicitly. So what it does is basically um, defines the ERPO standard to be the HIPAA standard. Uh, can you just scroll back to where you were? <laughs> Yeah. Can you scroll back to where you were? Yeah. Just so, can... okay. so how can a, a health care provider notify a law enforcement officer around a, um, when HIPAA's involved, when HIPAA's a, a federal law? Because that HIPAA includes that exception already. Oh, it that, does. That, yeah, oh. that lines 20 You may have said that. So, but... No, that's good. Um, so all I did was just track the uh, ERPO situation and just make clear that that qualifies under the existing HIPAA exception. Mm -hmm. uh, so would, you know, not just to get into the uh, anachronisms, but the education uh, <coughs> privacy uh, statute, uh, FERPA, would that be included in this? No, I don't think so. This is a, uh, I, I'm not totally familiar with that mm. statute, but mm. I think this is going to apply only to health care providers. No, no, well, the thing is that the transmission of information uh -huh. is the question. You know, so, uh, you know, a child's involved, right. you know, in this abuse. Right. And the mom's in one hospital bed, the child's in another hospital bed. Right. How does that information get transferred on the child? Because that's a different statute. Just a question. No, yeah, sure. it's, a, uh, it's a good question. I'm not, not sure of the answer off the top of my head. But it, I would think we'd need to, uh, you know, get some resolution. You're right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So, I mean, I just in hearing Tom's concern, I think one thing that's really important to know, even about the existing language in HIPAA, is that people are told up front that they, things are kept confidential unless it is going to hurt, you know, if th that there are two exceptions to that. So it's not like a, it's not like it, per, people weren't told ahead of time. It's not a gotcha kind of thing, and I think that's really important that yeah. that's disclosed when somebody starts counseling or whatever. <laughs> they're told, you know, unless I have to report, um, you've got plans to harm someone or, you know, mandated reporting. For so, yourself. Right, so it just <coughs> seems important to note that. And I assume, yeah, that would be similar to what the hospital would do. Right, right. Um, so the very last piece, of, uh, actually, very briefly, the, the very last section is a bill, I think it's, might be in this committee right now. 
or maybe it was last year. Yeah, page 675, which uh, uh, this is the last section of the bill, and all that does is it clarifies that uh, when the court issues conditions of release on a person, when the person uh, is subject to conditions of release after having been charged with a crime, um, that the defendant can possess firearms or other weapons. It's not a. Um, it's a. Um, it's a ability of the court, not a requirement. The court may order that. And they already have that ability. This just. This I, I would. Yeah, I, th I think that that's true. Yes. Okay. We'll certainly hear. Sure. So, but this would potentially make it more consistent. Yeah, and I think more express and more clear. Yeah. And that's the end of the walkthrough. Um, oh, oh, but any um, other questions that folks have? Or? Great. So, Eric, we um, have page 30 um, on the wall, right? And Remind me what that is. Um, so, I, so I believe it's similar to um, the relief from abuse portions in here, oh, right. but, but there are certainly constitutional concerns with that one, and so my understanding is that, that that's been drawn into, right? So often people come and look at what other bills we have. That's right. very much, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that uh, the language that specifically reflects the New Jersey Supreme Court's decision that's in there to address the search and seizure constitutional concern is not in H30. So that was added here um, to address that concern. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Questions for Eric? All right. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. So, Attorney yeah. General. Thank you. Thank you. I was noticing something different about the committee room. There is a basket full of peanut M&Ms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I, I made it nine days, my New Year's resolution, but I, I, I recall a basket of fruit and particularly oranges last year. Yes, you're right. So this is, this, 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 all this is a changed circumstance. But, uh, I'm happy to be here. We look forward to working with uh, this committee and, and, and the legislature this session. Uh, we fully support this bill. I'm T.J. Donovan, Attorney General uh, of the State of Vermont. Uh, this bill makes sense for public safety. Uh, and I want to focus on one part of this bill that I think is really the most important part of the bill. And Mr. Fitzpatrick did a great job explaining that. And we have to talk about domestic violence when we, we talk about this bill. And the point of the emergency orders, uh, I will call them TROs, temp Temporary re Relief Orders. <coughs> That is the critical time in terms of making sure that people are safe when uh, we talk about domestic violence. Uh, and to put it into context about domestic violence in the state of Vermont, it's a deadly problem in our state. Between 1994 and 2017, 50% of all homicides in Vermont were domestic violence related. 55% of those homicides were committed with firearms. And in 2017 alone, we had a total of 17 homicides. 11 were domestic violence related. And when you talk about going to file for that TRO, that temporary relief order in family court, that is because there is an issue of domestic violence and time is of the essence. And I talk about this bill as my experience as a criminal prosecutor. Yes, that temporary order is filed in criminal court, but oftentimes, family the court. family court, yeah. uh, oftentimes there's a companion criminal domestic violence case filed in criminal court or coming. And it's also important to point out that a violation of these abuse orders is a criminal charge called a violation of abuse prevention order, a VAPO, and we should look at those numbers as well. I'd also ask this committee to look at the number of temporary orders that don't turn into final orders. Yeah. Mr. Fitzpatrick, so that ex parte order is issued, you go to the court, you make that petition, the court makes a finding, and I think Mr. Fitzpatrick said 14 days. My experience, I can only talk about Chittenden County, 
was it was about a week. There would be you'd have temporary orders issued on a Thursday. They'd come back the following Thursday. And in every county in our in our state, you had a dramatic decline from the number of TROs that are issued to the number of final orders issued. And I think it's important to note that because domestic violence is so complex. It's so complex. And there's a whole host of factors that go in. And you, from a criminal prosecutor, the number of, I'll, I'll call it the failure rate of domestic violence prosecutions is one of the highest failure rates because of the complexity of this issue, because it's not just an issue of whether or not there was an act of violence or abuse. It's an issue of housing. It's an issue of resources. It's an issue of children. And many victims, many women, in my opinion, make courageous decisions to stay in these really dangerous situations because of the lack of housing. You talk to domestic violence advocates, you, you ask what's the number one issue you're going to hear about housing. And so we got to put this all in context when we say, why is this so critical to have this bill passed this year, particularly at when that temporary order is issued? Because it's about saving people's lives, that's why. And the numbers indicate that based on the number of homicides in our state that are related to domestic violence that are related to guns. And nobody goes to court to take this step unless they're scared. They're looking for help. And they're putting themselves at risk. And then you have to understand the court system. That oftentimes you, you may be down in family court because you've gone to the police, the first call is going to be to the police or the prosecutor. And we're going to say, well, let's make sure that you filed that temporary order in court. There may be an ongoing investigation. There may be a citation issued that may be 30 days out, 21 days out. Person may be lodged. There's no standardization of that. You're going to go to court. And what if that court, what if that court issues that temporary order? And then you're going home to the person that you just, that just abused you? So my support of this bill is because of those circumstances. And I would really urge you to listen to the survivors of domestic violence if they're willing to testify, because it is incredibly complex and it's incredibly dangerous. And we have to understand how these systems, oftentimes parallel systems, don't always complement in terms of the timing. And timing is of the essence here, because we're talking about protecting people. We're talking about protecting women. So studies have shown that the days following state intervention in a domestic violence situation are especially dangerous for the victim. Studies have also shown that removing guns from the scenes of domestic violence significantly lowers the risk victims will be murdered. This bill helps victims and survivors of domestic violence through a number of measures. It requires a respondent to an RFA to relinquish their guns upon the issuance of an RFA, both at the, t the temporary time, which I think is the critical time, as well as the final order stage. I think due process is protected by the provision at, uh, at the final order where they said if, it's, if the judge doesn't issue the order, they get it back. But again, we're talking about that seven days to 14 days, which is, I think is a really critical period of time where we want to call it a cooling off period or what, but let's make sure that people are safe during this time. And I think the due process uh, uh, is protected based on that language at the final order. It gives the relinqu re relinquishment provision teeth by instituting a warrant process so that a court can rapidly issue a warrant for police to seize weapons if needed. We believe that provision is constitutional uh, as well. The application process for the RFA will now include an option to collect information about guns that a respondent may have so that the information needed for the issuance of the warrants is quickly available and doesn't delay the warrant. Again, with the warrant provision, I think you're protecting everybody's due process rights. Um, so when a, 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 an RFA is filed yeah. and, and say served, I, I don't know if I have yeah. the right termination, yeah. to, but anyway, um, it's filed, it's served. Um, so why isn't a uh, vacate the premises, or maybe it is, uh, served at the same time, um, which potentially could um, 
alleviate the people getting back together or just seeing each other, that type of thing. And, and I'm going back to yeah. the gun collections yeah. that may not have to be, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, some pretty valuable yeah. firearms people have, and, you know, and uh, that type of thing that may not have to be removed from the premises if the uh, a vacate order is. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think Mr. Prince you talked about, about that discretion with the court at that temporary order. I mean, I, for me, that's the critical time here is a temporary order. Right. And I think if I'm understanding your question, well, if somebody vacates the presence, the, the residence, then there's no need for um, uh, an order to seize the weapons. And, and, not, and really nothing even to do with weapons at all. I mean, there, there may, no, may not be any weapons at all. I mean, you know, hands can yeah. be weapons or, or, or whatever. I mean, it's just the, the idea if there's a vacate order that um, everybody's going to be safe or you know, there's no. going to be a lot less chance of something happening. I, I, to me, it just, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, you know, and it just seems like it would be a logical thing. I, I think the key is, again, for me, it's public safety. Right. How are we ensuring that nobody is going to be placed in danger because they have access to firearms? And to be perfectly honest, and I say this as, as a lawyer, as a former prosecutor, as an attorney general, uh, people don't always follow orders. Right? We, 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 we have violations of conditions of release criminal charge. We have a BAPO criminal charge. You talk to survivors and victims and you say, does this piece of paper make you feel more safe? I'm not sure they're going to say yes. So I think, I, think, I, I think the issue of making sure people don't have access to weapons at a critical period of time is the public safety component that I'm focused on. I think you complement that back again at the final order. If there's not the final order issue, uh, that people don't feel that there is a risk of, of, of danger, then perhaps the uh, uh, the property is returned at that final order based on the court's ruling. So I, that's how I would address it, but I understand your point. I'm just trying to understand the process of how this works now under yep. current law. So what is, can the court issue something at this point? Because this, the language in here is that the, the order shall. Can the court, does the court have the authority to issue something similar to this now? I, sure, order? I think the court can issue anything it wants in terms of uh, court orders and, you know, it, the, but, it's, but it's not standardized. And I think that's, that's the issue here. So, so you're, the, the idea is to, to, um, to create sort of an across the board yep. way of dealing with it in the instance of these really dire situations. Yes, and I think, again, for me, why we want to standardize this and, and bring uniformity across the board is to protect women mm -hmm. and children when our numbers indicate the majority of our homicides are domestic violence and related to a gun. And somebody who's going to get a relief from abuse order is because they have been abused by a family member or a fear of abuse of a family member, which is, by definition is domestic violence and they want help. So it would make logical sense to standardize that practice in order to have that seizure of those weapons at that time. Are you seeing a reluctance of the court to issue something along this line? If, if I, can't sought, or? I can't speak for the court. I think, I, I think in my experience as a prosecutor, mm -hmm. cases are driven by facts. If you put the evidence in front of the court, they're going to act accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Right. So uh, I want to thank the committee for uh, considering this bill. I think this is an incredibly important bill. I think this is about public safety, uh, oftentimes of our most vulnerable population. The numbers indicate the need for this bill. This is best practice. It makes sense. And I urge the committee to pass this bill. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. For the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, thanks so much for taking testimony on H610 um, this morning. And just for the record, the Vermont Network rec uh, represents 15 independent nonprofit member organizations that provide direct services and advocacy to survivors of domestic and sexual violence across the state of Vermont. 
um, and on behalf of our members and the victims and survivors that they serve, the Vermont Network strongly supports H610. Um, as we discussed in committee yesterday morning, domestic violence homicide is a significant and persistent problem in Vermont. And although Vermont does enjoy a low overall violent crime rate, victims of domestic violence don't enjoy the relative safety that our state offers. Um, as the Attorney General referenced, half of all homicides in Vermont are domestic violence related and 55% of those domestic violence homicides are committed with firearms. So Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you That's again, right. like, I did, like I did yesterday. So you said, can you, can you elaborate when you said domestic violence victims don't enjoy um, you know, the data that I, I think you're talking about that while crime rate is going down domestic Yes, so while the overall violent crime rate, Vermont has the second lowest overall violent crime rate in the country, um, there's data that indicates rates of domestic violence um, indicated by things like the number of domestic violence felonies filed um, in Vermont is growing. Um, so victims of domestic violence aren't experiencing the same um, safety that uh, the rest of the state is. In, the, in that information, I'm just wondering if there's uh, um, any information collected that um, showed a catalyst for that? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, it could be a number of things. But. Yeah, I'd be happy to um, get back to you on some of that. I think there's a combination of factors. One is the way that the system is um, addressing domestic violence with more seriousness, looking at domestic violence as a course of conduct rather than an incident-based um, perspective. And I also think that, um, you know, there's evidence to indicate that as cultural norms change, as um, the conversation about the Me Too movement has emerged over the past several years, that the conversation about um, domestic and sexual violence is changing, um, and so it's being identified in different ways. The things that were going to my mind were things like poverty, drug abuse, things mm -hmm. like that. I don't know, maybe a part of it. I'm sure it is part of it. Those things can exacerbate um, domestic violence, but not necessarily cause it. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, research really indicates that firearms is are one of the leading uh, primary risk factors for domestic violence homicide and for um, lethality for victims. And access to a firearm by an abusive partner increases. Uh, the risk of death for victims by 500%, and there have been multiple studies that have um, affirmed this. <clears throat> so behind each of these statistics, which I know you have heard in this committee several times, um, is a Vermonter who is a victim of domestic violence homicide by firearm. Um, and those include people like Molly McLean, who is a 27-year-old um, mother in Maidstone, Vermont, who was shot and subsequently killed by her estranged uh, husband in 2017. And Molly's story is only one of many um, in Vermont and is not dissimilar <coughs> from Rhonda Gray in Fairley, Wanda Sandville in Windsor, Anako Lumumba in South Burlington, Aaron Allen in Danby, and many more. And for each of those stories, there's you know, families that are devastated and there are communities that are asking really what more can be done. So in 2018, the General Assembly passed Act 92, uh, which aimed to address the issue of domestic violence homicide um, and made important progress by allowing law enforcement the ability to remove firearms from the scene of a domestic violence incident. Um, and that addressed cases of domestic violence where there is a law enforcement response to a scene. But what was left unaddressed um, by that act was uh, situations in which survivors are seeking relief through the civil court process, through the relief from abuse order process. And since Act 92 was passed, we've also learned valuable lessons about the gaps that remain in our system of response, especially how uh, these vary across the state. And H610 aims to address domestic violence homicide by um, addressing these issues within the civil protection order process as well as other key um, protections for victims of domestic violence. Ms. Sarah, so when you, um, in terms of um, you um, dealt with the criminal. Um, That's right. Do more um, 
do more victims go the civil route in terms of relief from abuse? Um, is that generally? I, we also heard from the attorney general that sometimes there are there are um, both criminal and civil going on at the same time, or maybe the the criminal comes after. I don't know, mm -hmm. to. Um, so I can get you some of that data. I mean, I have the numbers right in front of me of the number of. Um, relief from abuse orders that were granted in FY17, which is the most um, recent data that I have available. Maybe the court can speak to that. So yes, sometimes uh, it happens concurrently, but I would also say that um, for many, many survivors, they actually seek the civil court process because they have reservations about engaging the criminal legal system, and so the civil process is an alternate path for them. Um, they have concerns about um, their partner being incarcerated or they're trying to seek um, relief for themselves in a way that um, isn't escalating the situation in a way that they don't intend to. Um, so what I thought I would do is just kind of walk through each section of the bill and um, talk about how it impacts victims of domestic violence, if that's all right. Um, so section <coughs> is the default proceed um, also known as the Charleston loophole, and ensuring that uh, firearms transfers subject to existing background checks are only finalized once the background check has been completed um, is relevant and important to victims of domestic violence. Um, one of the primary reasons that there may be a delay on the completion of a background check is the presence of an existing domestic violence record, uh, most often a misdemeanor domestic violence or a final protection order. One in nine unlawful gun buyers that's thwarted by the federal background check system is someone with a domestic violence record. Um, and there was a study that the Governmental Accountability Office um, did, I think it was 2006 through 2015, um, and they found that in approximately 30 cases where there was an existing domestic violence record by someone who um, was seeking to purchase a firearm, the background check was not completed in three days. Um, so that those background checks tend to take longer. Um, and uh, so there's reason to believe that um, if background checks do not come back within three days, there might be a reason for that um, related to domestic violence. There was a question that came up earlier about um, why this would happen and that there might be a criminal record that's not completely clear whether it's a domestic violence um, uh, offense or not. And I was just remembering uh, a domestic violence homicide that occurred in Vermont in which the individual had um, a record in New Hampshire. And I'm not sure if it's still the case, but for a long time, um, misdemeanor domestic assault in New Hampshire was called simple assault. And so um, there are ways in which criminal records aren't always clear um, whether something is in fact a domestic violence. Um, Domestic violence crime. Um, so that on, I was going to move on to relief from abuse orders unless so, there's any um, questions about that. Um, just help us understand for us and loophole, why, why the name? Some of us know, some of us do not know. Uh, so <coughs> the Charleston loophole was named after the, um, and I'll, I'll let every town also speak to the um, specifics of this, but was named after a mass shooting that happened in Charlestown. Um, and my understanding is that in that case, uh, the person was able to access firearms um, when, in fact, they should have been prohibited. Um, so sections two and three addressing relief from abuse orders <clears throat> are a critical and primary safety tool for survivors of domestic violence. Um, and as I mentioned, they're particularly helpful for individuals who don't seek to immediately engage law enforcement and, there are, and the criminal legal system. And there are many reasons that um, people might choose to do that. But seeking a protection order um, is also a significant risk for survivors. The six months immediately following um, separation um, from an abusive partner is the period of highest lethality for, and risk for victims of domestic violence. Um, although the risk does diminish significantly after one year of separation. And if granted, uh, protection orders are effective at keeping survivors safe over time. 
a meta-analysis of studies conducted on protection orders that was published in 2010, so a study of studies, um, indicated that protection orders lead to a long-term lead to long-term reductions in police reported violence. In FY 2017, there were 3,125 relief from abuse orders applied for and granted in Vermont, and 3,156 orders in that same year ended um, or expired, and so were disposed of by the court. So as orders are coming onto the system, many are also leaving as they expire. Um, as Eric noted, temporary orders um, are granted for 14 days or to four 14 days um, and final orders are granted for a fixed period um, and I'm sure Judge Gerson can talk about this but most often that's for one year and both temporary and final relief from abuse orders are essential and time limited and they're granted after a judge has made a finding that abuse has occurred um, and that there is a reason to believe abuse may um, occur in the future. And they provide comprehensive safety mechanisms for survivors, um, including limitations on contact, temporary custody arrangements, um, financial support, and firearm surrender, um, which can now be um, one condition that is ordered among many. And although this court-ordered relief can be life-saving for victims, it's essential that the system of response include targeted interventions that really address the lethality risks um, and ensure that the conditions of the orders are enforced. So currently there's significant variation across the state um, in the rates of orders that are granted and the conditions that are included in those orders. Because firearms are such a well-established risk factor for lethality, um, we believe that firearms ought to be addressed in each relief from abuse order proceeding starting with the collection of information from both plaintiffs and defendants about the firearms accessible to the, to the defendant. Um, and I just wanted to note that the Vermont's Fatality Review Commission made this recommendation to the Vermont Judiciary in 2015 um, for something similar, um, that firearms be addressed um, in every relief from abuse order um, proceeding. So when you, oh, when you say um, address, is that the, um, the collection the, uh, the language about? How many there are the exactly that currently there's one question on um, the petition for relief that addresses weapons broadly um, but because we know about uh, and I think in parentheses after it there's also an opportunity to talk about um, I think firearms is mentioned on that form but um, we certainly believe that addressing firearms because there is such uh, good research on that as a distinct uh, lethality risk factor that it ought to be addressed in every proceeding. Um, can you or, or, or somebody get us this form? Yeah, happily. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Matt, do you have a Thank you. Uh, you spoke about the differences around the state mm -hmm. uh, with how the, um, the relief from the use orders are sort of handled. Yes. Uh, couple of concerns about that are, is there support available for victims going into the system to know what they can ask for and how to ask for it and advocate for themselves in these really touchy situations? Um, and is it, is it um, along the lines that there's not support for people to know what to ask for or that the courts are actually denying um, options that would be available to, to them. Do you, is that data that you know? Great question. Um, so I would say on, on the first piece of that, um, mm -hmm. providing support to survivors as they're applying for relief from abuse orders and attending hearings for final orders is one of the primary things that our member organizations do. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them across the state are, um, actually I think all of them, are in court every week on what we refer to as RFA day um, to provide support to survivors. That doesn't mean that all survivors um, have access to an advocate or choose to work with an advocate. Um, <clears throat> and the, the second question was about uh, variations across, across yeah, the state. Yeah, more, more is, it, is it that you're sensing there's a hesitancy to, to apply mm -hmm. all the areas of relief or that we're not getting information out to ask for it? 
That's a great question. So um, I would agree with the Attorney General that the court is often looking at the factual evidence that's presented to them. So part of that, um, you know, we believe, which is one of the reasons that it's included in this bill, um, is asking the right questions mm -hmm. and making sure that they are eliciting the right information so that they're able to determine whether firearms um, are, are a concern. For many years, what um, we have kind of, the entire system of response has asked victims to talk about the incident that brought them there today, you know, um, whether it's law enforcement or the courts, to talk about kind of the most severe incident. And um, in many cases of domestic violence homicide, um, they haven't previously been shot, you know. Right. Um, so the most severe incident that they experienced may have been physical abuse, um, but the thing that's the lethality factor is the firearm that's sitting, um, you know, fully loaded or used as a threat. Um, all of the time. So, so I think that asking the right questions specifically about firearms will um, certainly help to standardize the approach to that across the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Coach. Yeah. Um, uh, just uh, uh, an interesting point uh, on, your, on your question. Yesterday, uh, Major Jonas uh, was here from the state police, and she's in charge of training and uh, retention of troopers and they're working on new protocols utilizing a lot of the lethality data uh, that's been supplied you know by the network and so when a trooper would uh, arrive at a scene you know they would use a very standard protocol uh, you know at the scene and hopefully get to uh, those questions you know, during that process so that's part of their piece that she's working on. She had mentioned that yesterday. Just let it check. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so there's variation across Vermont related to how often and whether firearms are ordered surrender as part of relief from abuse orders. Um, and recognizing the risks that are, are really inherent in this kind of geographic variation, many other states have uniform responses to firearms and protection order proceedings. So 30 other states um, prohibit all people subject to final relief from abuse orders from possessing or purchasing firearms, and 10 other states prohibit all people subject to temporary or ex parte orders from possessing or purchasing firearms. Um, and in addition, there have been several homicides where people, uh, where firearms have been ordered surrendered, um, but the defendant then goes and resides at a residence where they have access to firearms. Um, and so that's another thing that's addressed in H610. Um, <clears throat> so in order to, uh, in addition to actually ordering the, the surrender of um, firearms, it's equally important that when the order is served, the conditions are enforced. And once an order has been issued by the court, law enforcement is tasked with serving that order to the defendant. And we've heard from law enforcement that they often lack the tools needed to ensure firearm surrender can be enforced. And 610 attempts to address this concern by creating a process through which the warrants are sim can simultaneously um, be ordered when probable cause is present. Um, so in that piece of the bill, we're um, listening to our colleagues in law enforcement trying to respond to their concerns. Any, any questions about the relief from abuse order? On um, section four related to prohibited persons, as Eric noted, federal law creates certain categories of persons who are prohibited from firearms possession, including people subject to qualifying protection orders. But the same protection does not exist under state law. And this creates a troubling loophole from local oversight. So if an order is issued, that does not specifically list firearm surrender as a condition, the possession or purchase of a firearm by someone subject to a relief from abuse order cannot be prosecuted under state law as a violation of the protection order. So the person may still be prohibited from possession under federal law, but that can only be prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney. And while we're extremely grateful for the U.S. Attorney's um, cooperation, she actually prosecuted one such case in Barry uh, last year, 
we would like state law to more closely mirror the federal law prohibiting possession by all um, persons subject to relief from abuse order and allowing state's attorneys to prosecute these violations. On section five related to data collection, um, since the passage of Act 92, implementation has been varied across the state and I, um, the committee heard that in testimony from um, Major Jonas yesterday. And Jonas. Um, the data collection requirements included in Section 5 will assist in e efforts to ensure equitable geographic access to justice and the safety um, measures that are afforded by the Act. In, addi in addition, uh, the law enforcement field has indicated that challenges remain related to storage capacity on the local level for non-evidentiary firearms. And collecting data on the number of weapons stored by law enforcement agencies pursuant to this bill will assist in really helping us to define the scope and extent of those storage limitations. Um, section 6 to 11, I know that other witnesses will be speaking to extreme risk protection orders, but the Vermont network is supportive of efforts to allow family and household members and medical professionals to apply for extreme risk protection orders. Um, and we believe that these changes will create an important pathway for individuals with knowledge about imminent risk to personal and community safety to seek relief uh, from the court. I mentioned this yesterday, but there is an interesting overlap between um, suicide and domestic violence. A, many domestic violence homicides are murder suicides, but the other interesting piece is that um, Threats of self-harm or suicide is actually often a tactic that's used by abusers um, as, to coerce and control a partner. Um, and so we feel like there's relevance for the extreme risk protection order um, for victims there as well. And section 12, the Vermont Network supports clarifying um, the language that criminal conditions may include orders not to possess firearms. So there are three changes um, to H610 that the network would propose, and two of them are relatively technical and one is more substantive. And I'd like to just uh, touch on those. So in section two, um, there's language that says if the defendant testifies under oath that they do not have firearms, firearms do not need to be ordered, surrendered. Um, and we would suggest changing that language to if the defendant testifies credibly under oath. But it is 1103 C4. I don't have it sorry. So, it's really the defendant. If the defendant testifies credibly under oath that they do not have firearms, the firearms do not need to be ordered to surrender. So, yeah. And, and why? That's so, um, the language as it's written now. Um, we believe it would allow someone to, who even has um, firearms or there may even be some evidence that they are in possession or can access firearms, to go in and simply testify under oath that they don't have them and then the court does not need to issue um, an order of surrender. So we would like the court to be able to have a little bit more discretion around the credibility of that testimony. So how are they going to determine um, the credibility. I'm going to let uh, David Scher speak to that when he testifies. That's all right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and maybe I'll hear more from David as well. I, I see and understand the concern. I'm not sure that that's the best way to, to get at it. I think there needs to be clear that there should be a finding by the court uh, on, you know, based on that kind of testimony and whatever other evidence there may be of the existence of firearms to determine that. So yeah. there's probably other ways to, but I do, I do appreciate the concern on that. Thank you. Uh, section three uh, of 1104, this is at the temporary stage, um, C2. So currently the language in the bill requires the plaintiff to state with particularity at the emergency stage um, the type and location of any firearm in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control, or that another person possesses, owns, or controls on behalf of the defendant as part of their petition for emergency relief. 
Um, and while we strongly support the court inquiring of the plaintiff um, in every case about firearms in the emergency petition, um, we do not believe that plaintiffs should be required to answer this question. And such a requirement could jeopardize a survivor's self-determination and, and their safety. Well, I just wondering, I mean, are you suggesting alternative language uh, or, or uh, striking this? Um, I'm not suggesting striking it. I would be happy to submit some alternative language to you all. Question, okay. And finally, a more substantive issue is that the current bill does not include any mechanism for monitoring by the court to ensure that firearm surrender has been completed by the defendant. Um, so in effect, you know, the order is served. The court never um, doesn't have any way of necessarily knowing whether firearm surrender has actually been completed unless um, the victim themselves reports a violation of that order. Um, and in many ways, we're relying on the honor system um, with these orders. So in many other states, there are systems for monitoring compliance that do not result in burdensome requirements for the court system. And so the Vermont Network would recommend that language is added to require the defendant to submit an affidavit of compliance the next business day after the order is in effect. And if an order of compliance is not filed, then the court would set a show cause hearing as they do um, for domestic assault arraignments. So it's a mechanism for the court to have some confidence that um, the firearms have indeed been surrendered and that the defendant is taking that condition seriously. And, um, could you get or, yep, um, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, just a question about the necessity for that. Uh, so if, if the whole process is being set up such that uh, the relief from abuse order is issued along with the warrant, presumably when that order is being served, it's right at that time that law enforcement would, say, hand over the firearms. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just not sure the way we set this up, why we also need this. And, and maybe we do, I just, uh, if you could. Just sure, start. absolutely. So um, the information that may be included in um, <coughs> the order um, and in a warrant. So the warrant's going to require additional specificity and particularity about location and types of firearms. Um, and especially at the temporary stage, that information, um, if received, will have come from the plaintiff. And the plaintiff may not have a full understanding of every firearm that is in the defendant's possession or control. Um, and so by submitting an affidavit of compliance, the defendant is them themselves affirming that they are in compliance with that condition of the order, including access to all firearms. Mm -hmm. And you said that we have something like that in, 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 um, for domestic assault? For the so um, for domestic assault, uh, show cause hearings can be um, scheduled for the next business day. So the uh, you know, the hope would be that if the defendant does not file this affidavit, that it is treated by the courts, by the court as a violation of the order, and um, the court sets a show cause hearing. So, in, in a situation where, uh, uh, say, the, uh, the list is made of you know guns, potential guns that somebody owns, and on the list it says there's five guns over at the Jones's house. Mm -hmm the person who has had the relief from abuse order filed against them says, I don't have any guns there. What happens? Can you repeat your question just one more time? Sure. Um, there's a list of guns. On the list it says there's five over at the Je Jones's house. And the person who has the relief from abuse order filed against them say, says, I don't have five guns over at the Jones's house. Is that Mr. Jones or is Mr. Jo is the Jones? No, Jones that's not Mr. There, Jones. Okay. That's that's the person that's been accused of abuse. Uh, at a separate location. Separate location, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I'll defer to the Attorney General's office to answer that question. Right, because I can proceed. 
potentially. Uh, maybe there's no guns there in some of these houses. Uh, somebody's getting a warrant, they're getting a house search for no reason. And that kind of thing. Well, I think that that There's is unintended consequences. I appreciate the question, and I think that's one of the reasons that there was built in some um, protections and in that the warrant can only be issued if there's probable cause, and the probable cause requires certain information to be available to the court. Um, and so I feel like that creates some assurance that, that um, warrants aren't going to be ordered without probable cause by the court. Let the court talk about what kind of information they need to make a finding of probable cause. I just want to back up a little bit. Sure. Um, you started 55 cases of domestic uh, violence is guns. So half of all homicides in Vermont are domestic mm -hmm. violence related, and 55 percent of those homicides are completed with firearms. And how many homicides were there? I can tell you that. 17? Uh, so that was just in one year. 17 yep. was in one year, and 11 of them were domestic violence homicides. Um, and I don't know if that was last year or the year before. Looking at. Are you, are you seeking this total number of domestic violence homicides that were completed with firearms? Just last, just last year or just whatever Just last you, year. Do you know you of those you? 11, Carolyn? How many were firearms related? We can get that for you. Six. That's what I remember. Then the other thing is, you also said, if I heard this correctly, Vermont is the second lowest state overall in the country. Our overall violent crime rate is the second lowest in the country, but that safety is not enjoyed by victims of domestic and sexual violence. Is there any uh, data out there why we're the second lowest? I'm not aware. I, I'd be happy to look into that, but I'm curious on that. Other witnesses may be able to answer that question. I was going to wait. But thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've wanted to ask since we are the second lowest. You said that domestic violence is is going up, but where do we stand as far as the rest of the country? Related to domestic violence, I'd be right. happy to get you that those statistics. I just have the um, Vermont numbers kind of at, at um, right now, but um, I would be more than happy to let you know what the trends are looking like nationally and how we compare. Okay. Did you speak to the center for uh, 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 violence policy? Center? Right, right. So, does that partial so, answer that question? So that is a partial answer to that question in that the Violence um, Policy Center report, which I referenced in testimony yesterday, ranked us eighth in the country um, most recently in our per capita rate of domestic violence homicide. So that gives you some kind of relative idea, at least in that year, how Vermont compared to other states in the country. So eighth best or eighth, eighth worst? worst. Right. Yes, eighth worst. And we've been in the top 10 um, in that report twice in the past five years that that report's been issued. Another question? So we're. I try. Okay, so we're back on the record 610. Next witness is um, Ms. Ways Mays Williams. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Keegan Mays Williams, and I am policy counsel in the northeastern and southern regions of the United States in at every town for gun safety. And I'm here today to talk to you about two policies. But before I do, I just really wanted to thank this body for the immense work that it's done in closing the private sale loophole. Um, you know that that hasn't been done in a lot of other states. So thank you for that wonderful work. And I also want to thank you for being one of the top 10 um, states to, uh, to enact uh, extreme risk uh, protection order legislation. Um, so all I'm here to do today is to talk to you about a couple of ways that you can make your wonderful laws even stronger. And I'll start with the Charleston loophole. So just to make sure that um, I'm sure 
that we're all very familiar with what happened in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015? Actually, um, not necessarily, so thank you so much if you could, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. okay. On June 17, 2015, um, the Charleston shooter walked into a Bible study in a very famous black church in South Carolina. He sat with people um, who invited him to fellowship, even though he was a stranger, and they allowed him to sit with them for about an hour before he took out his firearm and he began to shoot. He hurt nine people, three people survived, and what we've learned later is that this person was actually prohibited federally from possessing or purchasing a firearm, hence the name Charleston Loophole, and that is how the name came about. So please, uh, if anyone needs to stop me, I just wanted to walk through the process of how uh, the Charleston loophole works. And um, I'm assuming, I, I'm just going to start as if no one understands how it operates. And please interrupt me if I'm saying more than is necessary to make it clear. Thank so you. what we learned later is that the shooter was actually prohibited. And he was prohibited because he had a felony drug conviction which prohibits someone from being able to purchase or possess a firearm. So the way that these criminal background checks actually work is that a federally licensed dealer is allowed legally to conduct, to begin that, to conduct a background check on an individual. However, after three days, if there is not a response which clears the person one way or the other, the firearm dealer is allowed to proceed with the transaction, whether or not there has been an actual result determining whether the person was prohibited or not. So this is how it actually works in practice. There are two ways that a firearms dealer is able to check on someone's criminal background. One, they can use something called e-check, which is an electronic uh, search. The other way is to call on the phone, and I think this way is historically the way that most um, firearms dealers have checked, um, but more and more people are starting to use each. So I'll walk you through the process of, of getting on the telephone as a firearms dealer. So an individual walks into a federally licensed dealer, a firearm dealer store. They say that they intend to make a purchase. They fill out a form, a federal form, and on that form, they offer their name and other personal identifying information. From the information on that form, the dealer will make a call to the customer service representative. And the customer service representative can say three things. The first thing they can tell you from entering the name and other identifying information is whether the person is prohibited. There might be an alert that says, do not, you may not proceed with the sale, this person is prohibited. And then, of course, the firearm dealer cannot go forth with the sale. Two, within seconds, the customer service representative can tell the firearm dealer, you may go forth, this person is not prohibited. Now, the reason that we're here today is to discuss that third area that it's a little bit murkier. And that is when there is an alert that says, I'm, there, there should be a delay because I'm not certain whether this person is prohibited or not. Now this can happen for several reasons. Now there, in different states, uh, record their criminal convictions in different ways. So for example, you are prohibited from purchasing a firearm if you have been convicted of a felony, for example. Now some state records may show that a person has been convicted for an assault, but it may not show that it's actually a felony rather than a misdemeanor. So it will be incumbent upon the person that works for the FBI to reach out to local sheriff's office, police departments, court, court offices to find out further information to find out whether or not the person is prohibited. Another way that a person is prohibited is because they have a domestic violence conviction, whether it be a misdemeanor or a felony. So another thing that uh, that may be alerted is that this person, I'll just use the assault example again, this person has an assault conviction. But what may not be clear is whether the person is guilty of assaulting someone in a bar fight or whether the person is guilty of assaulting their spouse. 
And so you may have to, again, reach out to local authorities to understand, um, to understand exactly the context, and that may take some time. Usually, it can take only a few extra minutes. In fact, the customer service representative allows the dealer to stay on the phone. And uh, I will refer you to this FBI report that's on the overhead in a moment, um, but the goal of NICS is to make sure that the dealer is on and off the phone within seconds. But what we've learned is in 2008, on average, the calls last a little bit more than two minutes. So either way, these calls do not take a long time. These checks do not customarily take a long time. But when it is important to reach out to local institutions or local agencies, that may take a little bit more time. So what we also know is that there are circumstances, another prohibiting factor, excuse me, is if someone, had, someone is prohibited if they have been involuntarily committed to a mental institution. Now, there may be an alert that someone has been admitted to a mental institution, but without reaching out specifically to that institution, it's not clear whether that commitment was in fact an involuntary commitment or a voluntary admission into the institution. So, so those are some of the uh, circumstances where you may have a delay. Now, to go th to walk through the process a little bit further, so what happens is after three days, the firearm dealer can decide to legally continue with the sale, whether or not they've actually received the results of the background check. Now, if a firearm deal, if a firearm dealer, excuse me. Now, what you should also know is that the FBI continues to search whether or not the firearm dealer uh, proceeds with the transaction, and. The FBI keeps track of the results, and we found that what happens is if the FBI finds out that the person is actually prohibited, they will reach out to the firearms dealer and ask whether or not the sale was made. And if, in fact, the sale was made, then FBI will reach out to ATF and ask, and then that person who was prohibited that was able to go through with the sale, they will be put on a firearms retrieval list. Now, as you can imagine, the ATF uh, is a large agency which may be overburdened, and we know at least in one case, the case of the Charleston shooter, his gun was not taken away from him in time. So, in terms of the amount of time that this actually happens, the actual um, frequency, I'll refer you to the FBI report from 2018. And I'm going to direct your attention to page 20. And committee and others, I, this um, either has been posted or it is posted. It, it is posted, right? Okay. Yeah. So what we can see here on this chart is that in 2018, 4,200 in, in, in 4,240 different uh, circumstances, the background check came back as a denial. And what we know of those 4,240 individual denials is that in those cases, 3,960 of those transactions, the dealer decided to proceed with the transaction anyway. So in the status quo, uh, without a Charleston loophole closure in Vermont, we're leaving it up to the firearms dealers to use their discretion as to decide whether or not the person will likely come back as prohibited or not. If you close this loophole, you won't have to have any concerns about that. Now, of the 280 remaining transactions, it's not clear whether that transfer was made or not, or whether the firearms dealer used their discretion to withhold from um, uh, completing the sale. But I think what this statistic shows you is that in 3,960 circumstances, the firearm dealer is likely to make that sale. Now, there are thousands of firearm transactions a year. 
as I'm sure we can all appreciate. And 4,240 transactions is bit an actual small percentage of the overall amount of transactions. But if you consider that the shooter in Charleston was one of those transactions, and obviously he's not a part of this particular statistic because that, uh, that, that occurred in 2015, but to imagine that there are 4,240 instances where a prohibited person may hurt someone, I think that the numbers are astounding. Um, so while it is not a great percentage, it is a great number of prohibited people uh, carrying firearms. So I think that that is really the uh, key point that I, I'm trying to make today. Excuse me. Yes. A real quick question. Yes. <clears throat> the 4,240, those are just the background checks that were the default proceed that uh, they actually shouldn't have, uh, they were prohibited, they actually ended up being prohibited. That's right. But is there a statistic as far as how many default proceeds there are in total? Is that a part of the statistics in here as well? Um, well, if you take a look at the report, um, you will see that well, basically, I should I should be clear that this report only covers 2018. Right. Uh, 2018 was the 20th anniversary of of Nix. So there are numbers within this report that cover the amount of denials there are in total. But if you take a look at the chart on page 20 and the chart on page 21, it gives a further breakdown of circumstances where the um, the the delay the, and, and further the categories of where the delay occurred. I, I hope I'm answering your question. Well, well, no, I'm just looking at how many actual delays there were because this is a subset. You know, it, it may have ended up for some portion of those delays mm -hmm. that they never they found out the person wasn't prohibited. Right. And there was not necessarily any follow up then, certainly. But it, is that statistic out there somewhere that? this is the number of times there has it's been a default action. proceed. You know, whatever the result, right. you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we know that 4,000 some uh, shouldn't have been transferred. Right. But I, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm unclear of the okay. exact number of delays that occur, but I do know that since this report has come out, that different states have taken steps to make sure that the records are more clear so that there are fewer delays, and so that there are, are circumstances, the circumstances where um, it is unknown whether the person is prohibited, prohibited or not, are lessened. Um, but I do not have that exact number. Um, but I, uh, I offer you this report um, as context. Yeah, I mean, this is the more important statistic for what we're doing. But I was just curious. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing that I was going to add is that there are actually 19 <coughs> states, in, in addition to D.C., have chosen on their own to close this loophole um, because the federal government, uh, the loophole still exists in the federal government. So um, there are other states that understand the need to actually um, have an effective uh, background check, one that, a check that is not just um, started but actually completed. So unless there are any other questions on this topic, I'm happy to move to the next one. Hi. I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask this question, so if you're not, just let me know. Yes. But I'm kind of curious what the experience is like for states who have moved forward with something like that. What I'm specifically concerned about is what is the time frame that you're looking at that you're actually stopping someone from, you know, how long is someone on, on hold for on, on the average that you're waiting for this check to come in because I'm assuming the three-day window was put in so that there was sort of a, at the time was there was a reasonable time frame of an expectation of when that check would be done. Mm -hmm. What does that actually look like in practice? Well, that's a that's a great question because it seems as though considering the check only takes about a few seconds right. at sometimes only two minutes. It seems that three days should be sufficient. Mm -hmm. But then there are circumstances, as with the Charleston shooter, where just a little bit more time may have been helpful. So some states have extended that time period to 10 days. 
but I do not know the actual numbers of how long it's actually taken the firearms dealer to actually complete the sale. Um, but if there are concerns that, you know, a person who is otherwise not prohibited would have to be unfairly impacted by waiting, which I think is at the heart of your question, um, my understanding is that, well, one, if you are not prohibited, then immediately the records will come back reflecting that. The people that this may affect most are people who it is unclear whether or not they're prohibited. Um, and, you know, I think that once the FBI has been able to ascertain whether or not a person is prohibited after looking locally into the records, it doesn't seem to be an issue that would happen again because now there is an actual uh, there is an actual answer. And as you probably also well know, after a criminal background check is issued, after 90 days, um, the criminal background check has to be removed from the system. Um, so it doesn't remain in the system afterwards. The check is made each time there's a transaction. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have yeah. No, a follow-up question. Yes. I, I seem to recall having seen that statistic somewhere that said that on average, mm -hmm. the default proceed adds X amount of time. If that's something you can see, if you could track down, since you probably have access to mm -hmm. lots of information, you may not know right off the top of your head, but I'm pretty sure that I've seen that statistic some, somewhere before. That, if that's something that you might be able to, to get back to us with. That the default proceed. Just, just how long does it usually take <laughs> if it takes more than three days? How long does the FBI on average take mm -hmm. to determine whether a person is or is not prohibited. You know, if it's not the immediate one, we understand that, right. but if it's, if it gets into the default proceed process, how mm -hmm. long does it, does it on average take? And I, and I can, and, and I can find out whether or not there is an average, but what I will say is that just, just uh, in case I wasn't clear before, when there is a delay, and there is a, a telephone call, typically it's not a circumstance where the dealer is told there's a delay you know, and tells the buyer, that the prospective buyer, that they need to come back. Typically, the dealer stays on the phone with uh, the person from the FBI and waits. So the implication to me is that it may take a little bit longer, but it doesn't necessarily take multiple days. But right. I think right. that the the purpose of closing the loophole is to give extra buffer just to be very sure that someone who is not supposed to have a weapon does not have a weapon. Um, along the same lines with, uh, with, with the three day waiting period, and, and I apologize if you said it earlier, I was at a press conference. So, um, um, so three days is going to catch X amount of people, no doubt there. So, uh, and any any days that are added after that, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna chip away at that four thousand plus number. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, I guess, and you, uh, you may not know, has there been attempts in, in Washington to make this a, 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 a change federally by going to an extra day, uh, uh, some different procedures, uh, that type of thing? I, I do believe that there there are bills in order to advocate for closing the Charleston loophole on the federal level, um, but it has not been passed. Right, right, right. Which to me would make more sense if, if the states are going to start doing it individually, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, there's some states that won't do it. Um, right. That it encompasses everybody that way, and everybody's right. under the same rules, and, and just. To me, just a day. If you went to four days on the, you know, the sketchy applications, but I, we I can't think, affect yeah. <laughs> Washington from here. <laughs> I would prefer for there to be a federal uh, law, uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, I, I would it, it would behoove communities to protect themselves until the federal government is able to do so. And in your materials, do you have a um, list of the states who have closed the loophole? I do, and, and they're whether or not they um, have certain days and their time frames, if any? Um, I, I have in my comments, and I have a list in my notes. Um, it's not in the FBI report, um, but I can just forward that information great. to you or great. tell you right now. But I can. Um, yeah, you can just I, get it to us. That'd be great. Yes, yeah. I can. Um, just yeah. one more real quick. Um, that, 
what was the number? It was around 4,200, say 4,280 yes. or something like, something like that. Yes. Um, so that, that's one year. So yes. how much does that fluctuate over different years? I gotta assume it fluctuates some. But. Right, um, I have to be honest, that is something that I also have to get back to you on. The FBI issued this report in 2018 because of their anniversary, their 20th year anniversary. Um, and this is the report that, that was, was quite telling, but I'm, as you said, I'm sure the numbers have changed and fluctuated. Hopefully because other states have done their due diligence to make sure that their records are more clear so that there are fewer delays, um, but I'm not sure is the answer. All right, um, so next um, I would like to move to the other uh, life-saving gun violence preve prevention legislation uh, that this body has worked very diligently to address and to thank you for that. Um, so as you are all aware, the extreme risk protection law is a law that allows um, the uh, prosecutor's offices and the, the attorney general's office to remove a fire, to petition the court to remove a firearm from someone who is experiencing a crisis um, and has made it clear that they may be a threat to themselves or others. So um, currently there are 17 states in D.C. who have this legislation, but as I said earlier, Vermont was one of the uh, top 10 states to do so. I think you were the seventh, so thank you for that. Um, so in your current bill, um, you allow law enforcement primarily to be the petitioners of the court. So what I would propose today is that you add family members to the list of petitioners that are able to directly petition the court. Question, natural question is why? Why is this so important? And the response that I have for you there is because in circumstances where someone is experiencing a crisis, time is absolutely of the essence. And I understand that when law enforcement um, is the first point of contact, there are uh, occupational hazards which make delays inevitable. Full disclosure, I was a criminal prosecutor for 10 years before I started my work uh, at every town, and I absolutely appreciate the delays that may occur just because of the nature of the job. So the way that I understand that this process works in, in Vermont, and I actually spent a lot of time reaching out to local prosecutors' offices all over the state just so that I could be very clear. Upon the reading of the statute, I had my ideas of how it might work in practice and where delays might be embedded, but I thought it made, bless you, made more sense to actually reach out to the people who were actually doing the work and talk to them and get a sense from them what the process looked like in practice. And what I learned is, even though prosecutors' offices are able to directly petition the court, the investigation doesn't actually start there. Family members are an integral part of the ERPO petition process. They are the people who are the ones that notice when their loved one is going through a crisis. They're just the first ones to notice. So what typically happens in Vermont, based on my understanding from speaking to people over the last two days, is what first happens is that an individual needs to go to their local police department. They need to file a report or a complaint about some threat that they witnessed, some behavior that they found to be concerning. At that point, a police department has to assign that report to a police officer. There needs to be an investigation. And during this investigation, the police are responsible for making sure that there is a sworn affidavit from each and every witness attesting to this threat. Once, they're con once they have completed their investigation, then they go th to their local prosecutor's office. And then once they get to the local prosecutor, then the local prosecutor has to take a look at the form, and I remember doing this in my, my, my own practice as a prosecutor. You have to make sure that law enforcement has asked the right questions. You have to do your own legal assessment of whether or not the standard has been met. And then if there are follow-up questions, you need to take the time to ask those follow-up questions to make sure that the standard has been met all before <coughs> you go to the court and ask for the petition. Now, 
most prosecutors I spoke with said that it could take up to a week. And it makes sense. There are certain prosecutor offices in the state that are only part-time. There are certain places that only have uh, seven employees. It's, it's a smaller state. But for a person who's experiencing a crisis, every extra hour really counts. I'm going to offer you a statistic. In Vermont, the rate of gun suicide is 87.5%. That is the biggest crisis occurring in Vermont right now. And ERPO is the best tool in order to remove a firearm from someone who is truly in crisis and may want to hurt themselves. And what we know is that family members are usually the first ones to know that a family member might want to hurt themselves. So if a person has to spend the time to reach out to an overburdened or a very busy uh, police department who has to take the time to conduct the investigation, who then has to take the time to take it to the prosecutor's office, who needs to make sure that all the forms are filled out correctly, um, and then finally get it to the court during court hours, it, it can really add a lot of time to the process. Now, if a family member... Just, uh, I apologize. Yes. I want to make sure I understood that statistic. Yes. Could you repeat that again, 87.5%? I'm not sure I understood. Uh, so, 80, so of the fire of the firearm deaths that occur in Vermont, mm -hmm. 87.5% of those deaths are suicides, are firearm suicides. Is that clear? So the yeah. death, the firearm deaths that occur in Vermont uh, are homicides, are intentional shootings, are, um, there are a lot of different categories, but the largest category, uh, overwhelmingly the largest category is firearm suicide. For all firearm deaths? Yes, in Vermont. Okay, all right, all fire, okay, thanks. Okay, and another statistic that I will flag is that the rate of gun uh, suicide by firearm in Vermont has increased by 58% between 2008 and 2017. So it's a real crisis here in Vermont, and um, Having a family member be able to speak with the court directly, I, I believe, would be a really um, expedient way to make sure that uh, relief is received when it should be received. Another issue that I encountered when speaking with one of the local prosecutors over the last few days is that some judges do not allow for hearsay in their court. They hear from the police officer what a family member told them they witnessed or what they heard. And some judges do not accept that information. So now you have to take time to reach out to that family member. If Vermont, if this body was to add family members to the list of petitioners, we would clear up the hearsay problem, further limiting the time taken. Another issue is that most of the um, people that I spoke with told me that many of the cases that they encounter where an ERPO <coughs> petition was sought were cases where someone made a threat to harm someone else. Few of those uh, circumstances involved actual uh, a person hurting themselves. And since we know that death by firearm um, in terms of suicide is the biggest threat in Vermont, I think it's clear that some family members don't think to reach out to law enforcement when they're person, you know, is at risk of, of death by suicide. I don't think that it's um, a logical uh, conclusion for most people to reach out to the police when, they're, when their loved one uh, is having suicidal ideations. So that is just another reason why I think it would behoove the court to allow um, the family member to have direct contact with the court. Now, there are 17 states in D.C., as I, as I said, that have ERPO legislation. And of those 17 places, including D.C., 13 of those places have family members as petitioners because they also appreciate, um, they also appreciate that family members are such an integral part to this process. I will tell you that although ERPO legislation is really new, 
uh, it, it takes some time to kind of understand those numbers. But one thing we know is that in, Verm in, in Maryland, when given the option of either reaching out to law, law enforcement or directly petitioning the court as a family member, there is an almost 50-50 split of family members reaching out on their own. In Oregon, I believe, the split is 66-33 in favor of law enforcement. But what, I, what I'm seeing in that result is that maybe with greater outreach and education, family members know that this tool exists and that they can reach out to the court themselves in order to get relief as quickly as possible. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if in any of these situations or scenarios, mm -hmm. it seems like it's easier um, if somebody is in crisis mm -hmm. or a family member <coughs> to loop in either the physician or mm -hmm. the therapist mm -hmm. and have them help make the report because that might be easier on a family member and I don't know if that's something that's been explored <coughs> because again, you're right, it is an illogical conclusion to think of my, you know, my loved one is in crisis, I'm gonna call the police, especially if you've been here for a few days, you've probably heard about some of the um, unfortunate situations that have happened with law enforcement and people that are struggling with mental illness. The outcomes are not always great, and so I think a lot of loved ones will not want to reach out to the police, and it's scary, it's a scary to go to court. So, are other, so are other categories like <coughs> family friend, family physician looked at as a effective tool? What I will say is that you know uh, opponents of herbal legislation in general tend to focus on the mental health uh, portion of mm -hmm. why herbal may be necessary and. And in, or, in our organization, we like to focus on the fact that the person is either in a long-term crisis or temporary crisis. Some of the crises that we see are, um, you know, a, a relationship has gone sour, and maybe it's not a mental health issue exactly, but, you know, terrible things happen in people's lives, and sometimes in a, in a very rash decision, you just may need some time to think and be without your weapon so that you, you don't make a rash decision. Um, so I think that's the reason that we have not focused on the doctor aspect because I think that uh, many of the people who ERPO could help don't actually have actual physicians or people that are helping them with long-term issues. Um, but I will say that there are other states, and I guess this is a good time as any to go to the ERPO chart um, there are other states that have allowed, I'm not sure if I'm doing this properly. Well, um, you have it in your, uh, I, I'll look at it uh, before me. I'm not exactly sure how to get. Um, but you'll, you'll take a look at your chart and you will see that medical professionals are a part of uh, they are a part of the petitioner process in other states. So it's not unheard of, um, but we tend to, to think that it, it may distract um, other people from focusing on the fact that you can be in a crisis in a less than formalized way. So, so that's the only reason that we tend not to advocate for that, but right. I, I, I hear your point. Like for example, in Burlington we have um, street um, counselors that are mm -hmm or in touch with people who probably don't have a lot of access to, you know, they're not going to a therapist once a week. Right. Um, and so they may see somebody be more erratic. Or, so it does seem like, or every time there's a mass shooting, it's always like, well, he was acting funny at work, or, you know, like, so it somehow, oh, so, Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Sure. Um, so yeah. somehow encouraging people to do more than just say, oh gosh, that person was acting kind of weird. Right. Um, maybe part of an educational campaign to say, you know what, here's, right. I'm not sure we want everyone going to court either, but it does seem like 
what we ask bystanders to do or family helpers mm -hmm. seems a key piece. <laughs> and and I, I agree with you yeah. because family members are involved anyway. Right. Um, it's just an issue of when they can be involved and, and how quickly there can be relief. Is there, hi, is there any uh, data that when a family member gets involved mm -hmm. and like reports mm -hmm. a potential problem, what the rate is of something bad happening to that family member? The rate of, so I, I've heard people discuss this and I think that you're probably talking about a domestic violence context, which I defer to my colleagues uh, to answer. Pretty much that. local. Um, but what I have learned, honestly, from speaking with the local prosecutors in Vermont and also from some of the work that I do in Florida, um, that in large part, these orders tend out to be not adversarial at all. In fact, in most cases, there's a stipulation that's entered where there isn't even a hearing that the respondent comes to court and they stipulate that, you know what, I think I could benefit from having my firearm removed. So in more cases than not, and, and actually that statistic is a surprise to most of us, and I will say that I, I don't, we are slowly getting more statistics because most legislation is very new, but in the places where I have been able to um, not gather formal research, but I've been able to speak with judges who have presided over ERPOs, and most recently when I've been able to speak to prosecutors in your state, Many of them have told me that in this, the few circumstances where they have uh, petitioned the court for ERPO, they have not had to have a hearing, that most people agree that they're not doing well at the moment and that they could benefit from having their firearm removed. And, and that was actually really surprising. So I guess that's a longer response to your question is I, I have not heard that. I have heard that concern, but I have not heard that reality. Well, I very much appreciate your time, and I will uh, get back to you with all the follow-up uh, places, unless there are any more questions for me. Yeah, thank you. Any, any other? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so everybody, I'm going to adjourn us now, um, close to lunch, and uh, certainly have a number of people that weren't able to testify today and that also um, were not ready to testify. So my plan is to take this up on Wednesday morning.